So Deuteronomy chapter 14, uh, right there in verse 1, it says, uh, Ye are the children of the Lord. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. So right out of the gate, before God gets into all of the do's and don'ts of the dietary restrictions, these first two verses, he gives us the why. Why is it that he's laying all these, uh, what the Bible calls, as we'll see later, carnal ordinances upon man? Why is he putting these restrictions in the place? Why is he saying, don't do this, don't eat that, you can't eat this, you can't eat that? Well, it's because of verses 1 and 2 where he says there, ye are the children of the Lord. And, you know, that's a very special thing to be God's child. You know, that's, that's not everybody is God's child. And, you know, we live in a world where people ha have this philosophy that, you know, well, everyone's going to heaven, everyone's God's child. Well, that's just not Bible. You know, Jesus said, you know, there, that there are few that be saved. He called us his little flock. And he goes on and he kind of uh, further explains that there in verse 2. He says, for thou art an holy people. And what does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart. It means to be different, right? And he even further clarifies it by saying that he hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people. And peculiar meaning, you know, not in the sense that we're weird, you know, but in the sense that, you know, we're different, that we're not like everybody else, that there's something about us that is different. And that's the why right there, you know, because of the fact that not everybody is a child, you know, that makes what we have a very special thing. You know, that if we believed in Christ, we are his child that we've been set apart, you know, we're made distinct from that which is common. We're not, you know, I'm not saying that in a puffed up way, and I don't think we should walk around thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm God's child and you're not. You know, we endeavor to make others God's child. We want other people to join us. You know, uh, would to God that the whole world were God's children. Would to God that that were true. That they, they wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't be many that go to destruction, as Jesus said. But the fact is that there are few. There are few that be saved. That it is a peculiar thing that we have here. That we ha are unique. That we are different in the fact that we believed on Christ, and He has set us apart unto Himself. He has purchased us with His own blood. That's a very special thing. And you know this applies to them back then. You know He chose one nation out of all the nations of the earth to be a light unto the Gentiles. When He was one nation that He brought out of Egypt, and that He brought, uh, you know, he brought up out of bondage and raised up. And, and, you know, that applied to them then, you know, as being a peculiar people, and it applies to us today as well. And if you would turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll see that where this is reiterated to some degree in 1 Peter chapter 2. This is New Testament. You know, this applied to Israel back then, but this applies uh, uh, to us today just as much as it did to them uh, back then. You're going to 1 Peter 2. It says in Titus 2 that, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. So there's that word again, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He says there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you'll, you'll see this sounds very familiar. He says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth uh, his, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, what we have is very special. What we have is very dear to us. That's why he goes on in verse 11. It says, Dearly, beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims and abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So <clears throat> that's what a, we can apply these verses to ourselves today. And really, that's the why. And, you know, that could be the, the why for many of the reasons, uh, for many of the things that we do today, and many of the things that we observe today as well as Christians. You know, we, even in the New Testaments, we have a lot of do's and don'ts, right? There's a lot of things, like he says there at the end, right, of, of 1 Peter chapter 2, abstain from fleshly lusts. You know, God commands us in the New Testament not to be fornicators, not to be covetous, not to be drunkards, not to be all these things. And why is it? It's not just because God's trying to ruin our good time down here, right. even though those things, you know, might, might, there is a pleasure for sin for a season. You know, they don't really, uh, you know, it's not really worth it in the long run. But why is it that God says abstain from these things? Because of the same reason that he told them here in Deuteronomy to not do the things uh, that he's about to tell them to do that we just read. Because they are dearly beloved, because they are percu uh, peculiar people, because they are holy, because they are set apart, because they've been sanctified. <laughs> so <coughs> that applies to us today just as much as it did back then. And, you know, he says, he's calling them a holy people, right? Somebody that is set apart. And we can think about examples in the scripture of, of where things are referred to as holy. And one that comes to mind is, 
when Moses uh, was, um, you know, spoke with the Lord at the burning bush, what did he tell him? He said, take off thy feet for the place where on thou standest is holy ground. It's sanctified. It's different because it was in the presence of God. So <clears throat> we establish this holiness or we, we, we don't establish it, but rather I should say that we, we display it or we show this holiness, or at least they did uh, back then, uh, through the behavior, through the way that they lived their life, through the things that they did do and they didn't do. You know, and even before we get into the dietary restrictions, he's saying, look, there's certain things that you as my people uh, will not do, that I command you not to partake in, that I want you to be different, set apart, peculiar unto me in this way by not doing certain behaviors. And he says here, one of them, of course, is not cutting yourselves, right? <laughs> this was a heathen practice, if you recall. This is something that they did, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was demonic. And he says there, in verse 1, you shall not cut yourselves nor make any baldness before your, uh, between your eyes before the dead. Now, I didn't really get into the making the baldness between your eyes. You know, that's kind of a, I don't want to say it's necessarily a vague term, but it's not really, we don't really use that vernacular today. Now, when we read that, we you know, I don't know about you, but I immediately think of like this spot. I'm like, well, it's already bald, <laughs> you know, so I'm good there, right, you know. But I think what he's referring to, and if you look in other passages, we'll see it in Deuteronomy, it says you shall mar the corners of your beard. You know, not make any, you know, not to make any strange markings or to shave your head for the dead, things like that. So he's saying, like, you know, I believe he's referring to, you know, this could be considered between your eyes as well, couldn't it? You know, it's just the other way around. So <laughs> maybe that's what he's talking about. And I'm treading very lightly here because, you know, that spot, you know, some of us, we, we like to make that bald, don't we? So <laughs> I don't think that's what he's referring to. That can continue, all right? Let's just move on before I get myself in really hot water there. So, but more particular, he's talking about the cutting of yourselves. No cutting of yourselves. Now, why is it that he didn't want them cutting themselves? Well, one, you know, it's not healthy. It's not good for you. I mean, that's a very uh, bad thing to do. If you're, you know, people who are doing that are very disturbed people often. Uh, people that are going through, you know, uh, very serious bouts of depression. And I believe in many instances, people that are even, uh, 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 you know, demonic, that have been possessed by the devil. This is something that we're going to see here, if you would turn over to Mark chapter 5. But he's saying, look, there's certain behaviors you're not going to participate in that you as my people are not going to do because you are holy unto me. And one of them is to not cut yourselves. And this was a heathen practice that went on back there and still goes on today. You know, I remember when uh, before the whole, before it was emo, it was called goth, all right? And who remembers that, right? When I was in high school, they called the emos the goths. And they listened to a certain type of music, and they dressed in all black, and they moped around, and they had long hair, and they, paint, they powdered their faces, and they'd paint their nails black. And one of the things that they would do is that they would cut themselves. In fact, I had a friend that I grew up with in elementary school. We spent a lot of time together. And then in, in, he was a grade ahead of me and going through junior high and, and then into high school, we drifted apart and he became one of these goth people. And uh, later we kind of reconnected. I would bump into him and talk to him from time to time. But it was well known that he was known throughout the high school for being the kid that cut himself, that would cut things into his arms. And his idea of a good time was to go hang out at the graveyard. And uh, you can kind of see why we drifted apart. I just said, you know what, I'm going to keep playing basketball and skateboarding. You can go cut yourself in the graveyard, <laughs> right? So, uh, <coughs> but that's something that, you know, it still goes on today. This isn't, say, a little, you know, preach something relevant. This happens. This goes on, you know, and I'm, I'm sure nothing's changed. You know, I'm sure even people today could uh, testify the fact that they know people that still uh, practice this, this demonic practice of cutting yourself. And, you know, it reminds us, of course, of when, uh, Elijah was calling down fire from heaven when he withstood the prophets of Baal. And he said, you, you recall the story, he said, put the ox on the, on the, they were to put their ox on the altar and, and call upon the name of the Baal. And whoever sent fire down from heaven, he was to be, he was the God. And what did, what did the prophets of Baal do? Well, one of the things that they did is that they cried aloud, right? And it says, and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets. So people that are, you know, uh, demonic, these, these prophets of Baal, right, these, these wicked false teachers, uh, one of the things that they practice, it says after their manner, you know, this is something that they, were, they did commonly, yep. was to cut themselves. And <clears throat> so this is something, you know, cutting yourself is associated with heathen, it's a heathen practice, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that you see associated with demonic possession even. We'll look here in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. 
And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. Now, that doesn't mean a spirit that was rolling around in the mud. You know, that's talking about a, a, a demonic spirit. You know, a, 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 you know, we would say it was, uh, you know, it was devilish. It was a fallen, it was a demon, right? And he says in verse 3, and who had his dwelling among the tombs. So he's talking about this man who's possessed. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broke in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, right? There's that graveyard again. And crying, and what was he doing at the end? And cutting himself with stones. So you can see why God doesn't want his people participating in this. Now, I'm not going to say every time somebody is, is involved in this practice that they're demonic. But they're definitely, they're either, they either are possessed by a devil or they're being influenced by somebody who is possessed by a devil. A lot of times people get into this, especially in high school and stuff like that, they're, where they're, people are, are, are trying to fit in and they're, and they're impressionable and they're trying to fall into a certain crowd. You know, they might just start doing this to try to fit in. Or, you know, maybe their favorite music artist, you know, encourages this. And maybe they've been listening to, I don't know who's out there anymore, but, you know, in my day it was Marilyn Manson, you know, a great name. You know, Nine Inch Nails, these type of bands that are, you know, into these type of things, you know, and we could, and I don't want to go on and on about that, but... You know, we could see here that this practice of cutting yourself is demonic in nature. Now, this also would include tattoos. You know, I believe that this would include tattoos as well. The tattoos are not something that we as Christians should be getting. You know, and let me just preface by saying, you know, if you have tattoos in here tonight, I'm not, you know, that, that's in the past, you know. You know, I understand people get saved later in life. They come to this knowledge later in life. And my goal is not to, you know, pick on people or make them feel bad. But there's a whole lot of people in this room who have not gotten tattoos that one day might be tempted to get a tattoo, you know, and if they, and there's a lot of, and they need to hear this, you know, and if you're, if you're right with God tonight and you have a tattoo, you're going to want them to hear this. And in fact, I don't think there's anybody in this room that if somebody came to you, if someone that didn't have a tattoo came to somebody with a tattoo and said, hey, I want to get a tattoo, that person with a tattoo, if you're following me still, would say, no, don't do it. I believe every person in this room that has one, if they're right with God, and I believe they are, would tell the person without one to not get one. Because number one, they're permanent. You know, and don't buy into this whole thing where they say, oh, it can be removed. Yeah. You know, some, if you, now, if you're one that you know, got one with a homemade gun with like Bic pen ink, you know, or, you know, or some really bad, unprofessionally done tattoo that is just on the outer layers of the, of the skin, you know, you might have a chance of maybe getting that taken away, but it's still a very painful process. It's still going to leave a scar. It's still going to leave a mark, you know. But if you're one who actually went to a professional tat I mean, tattoo parlor, they're serious about their profession, and it's, they, they, they want it to last. They want it to remain bright and colorful. I mean, they're, they're going to they're gonna have professional guns. That thing's not coming off, friend. You know, and I, and I'll, and, you know, I have some of my best friends are covered in tattoos. And, you know, I, can, I, I don't even notice it, you know, but you know, when this comes up, we've got to preach it. But even one of those friends, they've even showed me pictures, hey, I went to have this removed with a laser. And what it does is it causes the skin to boil up and you get a blister. And he said it was more painful than the tattoo. It's more painful and expensive than getting the tattoo to the point where you don't even bother. Because it's not even going to get rid of it in the end. It's just going to dull it and fade it. And maybe, maybe it make it less noticeable, but it's still going to be there. So don't get tattoos if you haven't got one. And if you have got one, you know what? Confess it, forsake it. It's in the past. You know, and we have that new body that's coming. And, and praise God for that. And, but, uh, you know, this is a, a particular... And you say, well, how is that cutting? Well, how does that get into cutting? Well, that's what tattooing is. It's making a bunch of little cuts repeatedly, very fast, at a high rate of speed in your skin. A needle plunging into your skin. You know, I mean, maybe it's not slicing, but it's definitely piercing the skin and putting ink into your body. So that, I believe that would count as cutting. Amen. And you know what? If that's not good enough for you, you, you could turn to Leviticus chapter 19 and read verse 27 where it says, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And, you know, that's a verse that even a lot of Christians today don't even know is in the Bible. You know, I remember when I first got saved, uh, I, I was hanging out with this guy who claimed to be a Christian, and he very well may have been. I don't, I don't know. I never didn't really have enough discernment to kind of feel him out there, but he, he definitely came from a godly home with Christian parents. 
And I remember him saying, and so, you know, the Bible says it's okay to get tattoos. I'm like, where's the verse that says that? I don't know. And he was just all mad, you know. And then I read this. I'm like, it says the exact opposite. Yep. It says don't put any prints. I mean, what else could that be talking about? You know, that's not talking about, you know, the, your, your toddler sitting down with, the, with just going to town with, a, you know, a, one of those Crayolas or whatever, the little washable markers. They get it all over their hands, you know. I don't walk, you know, my kids do that all the time. They'll be drawing something and then you'll, you'll look them over to you later. They'll have pen all over their hands from all their, their creativity. And I'm just like, don't you, haven't you read Leviticus 19, 27? <laughs> You're printing marks upon you. You know, that's not what it's referring to. It's talking about putting, you know, tattoos on your body. Right. Because this is something that's been going on for a long time. Because this is something that, you know, and it used to be it was, it was you know, only a certain group of people got that kind of thing, that they would go get tattoos. But now it's become so popular that it's very fashionable to get, to, to get a tattoo. I mean, we'll see policemen walking around now with just full sleeves. You know, they're representing their community and they're just, you know, they walk around with these, these, these full tattoos. It's just like, it's weird. You know, but that's where we're at in this culture. It's become so popular uh, that, uh, you know, it needs to be preached against. Someone needs to stand up and say, hey, the Bible says don't do it. So don't do it. And God says that's one of the things he doesn't want you to do. Why? So be set apart. And you know, why do a lot of people get tattoos? So they can look different. So they can be unique. So they can draw attention, right? But we're getting to the point now where not having a tattoo is what's going to make you unique. You say, hey, well, what, what, what kind of ink you got, man? Well, I haven't got any. Wow. You're weird, you know? You want to stand out in a crowd these days, you don't get the tattoo, right? So uh, Christians should not be getting tattooed. They should not be uh, cutting themselves. And, they should, and, and there's several other things here. Namely, when it comes to the diet, that God says, look, these are, there's certain things you're going to eat and certain things you're not going to eat. And why is that? Why is God putting all these do's and don'ts here? Again, because he wants to put a difference between his people and the heathen. He wants to put a difference. He wants uh, us to be holy unto him, to be a peculiar people. Right. So he goes on in verse 3 and he starts talking about the not eating and the eating of certain animals. Which animals are allowed and which animals aren't. And, you know, this is just a long, this is just a, you know, a litany of, of different animals that we are uh, allowed in, uh, to eat and not to eat. I really don't know that we need to go through the whole thing. Now, this wasn't in my notes. You know, if, if, now, here's the thing. You can go over this list. I know we just read it before the service. If you really f want me to feel like I need to break down every animal for you and tell you, you know, we can do that later. For sake of time, I'm not going to do it. I don't feel like I'm, you know, glossing over the Word of God or trying to avoid some, you know, controversial portion of Scripture here by not reading this. I think we're just sparing ourselves a little bit of time. But I'm kind of shooting from the hip on this one. I will point out the fact that it says, uh, <coughs> never, uh, where does that, there, where he says you shall not eat the hair, right? The, uh, well, we might just end up having to read the whole thing here because I can't find it in my notes. Oh. Verse 7, Nevertheless, you shall not eat uh, of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven foot as the camel and the hare, which is referring to like a rabbit, right? Now, I've heard some people, and again, I'm shooting for it, but I probably shouldn't be going down this road, but I've heard some people say, well, a rat, the, the modern day rabbit doesn't chew the cud. It doesn't do that. So, they, so they'll say, aha! And you see, the Bible is wrong here because it says that they eat the cud there, that they chew the cud, where we know that the rabbit does not. Now, I, again, I, don't, I should have taken the time to go on Google, I was just thinking about this as Brother Garza was reading. I remembered this came to mind that somebody had said that to me once. Now, does anyone know whether or not that's true? Does the hare chew the cut or not? I've, I think I've seen them do it. I thought I was in the impression that they did. Now, so maybe so. Maybe somebody's wrong. But here's the point I was going to make. It doesn't matter to me if that if the, if the rabbit today does not chew the cud. It doesn't even. I'm not going to. You think my whole faith is resting upon whether or not, you know, whether the the, the silly little rabbit is chewing its cud or not. Like, I'm going to go, oh, the Bible's wrong. You know, like, oh, well, here's, here's a possible explanation. Let's say that the rabbit doesn't chew the cud, and it sounds like it very well may, so maybe this is pointless anyway. <coughs> but let's say it didn't. Or, you know, and you could apply this to something else, maybe. You know, th another objection like this comes up. If, if let's say it didn't chew the cud. Well, you know, do you remember when this was written? Thousands of years ago this was written, right? So really that would just testify to the fact that animals change on their own. Right. That animals adapt. You know, maybe it could just be that the rabbit has adapted. Now, it sounds like the rabbit hasn't changed at all. But, <laughs> you, know, whew, you know, we could continue to be Christians today, right? Because the rabbit still chews the cud, right? And, like, people point out things like that, like, aha! You know, and they think they just blew your whole faith right out of the water. Right. 
And, and we shouldn't be just so shaken by that. Well, here's a possible explanation. Perhaps that animal has done exactly what it's God created to do, to adapt, to change. Not evolve, you know, a microevolution, not evolve in the sense that it was once a different animal, right. but that it's actually adapted to a different set of circumstances where it no longer needs to chew the cud. I, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to break that down, why that might be or why not. Anyway, again, kind of shooting from the hip there, but I thought it was worth pointing out that, hey, you know, little things like that in the Bible, th there could be another explanation. But uh, <coughs> now when we read through this list, you know, there's nothing inherently bad or good about any of these animals. You know, he, he starts to talk, now I will say he starts to talk about, you know, seafood there. It has to be anything, uh, <coughs> in verse 9, these shall, you know, ye shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall ye eat, Right? So there goes your lobster, or as I affectionately call it, the sea rat, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little rat of the sea scurrying around under the rocks. It's got a weird tail. You know, there goes your shrimp, which has also been affectionately called the sea cockroach, <laughs> right? Another bottom feeder, right? But so delicious at the same time, right? So this would be kind of a bummer back then, right? Because we enjoy those things, right? Now we could eat the cow, right? So you'd go to the restaurant and they'd say, hey, it's surf and turf on the menu tonight. Well, no surf for me. Right, well, praise the Lord for the New Testament, and we can have the lobster tail and the, the steak as well. So, but why is that? Why is it God saying no lobster? Is it because lobster is bad for you? Is it because shrimp is bad for you? Is it because any of these animals have some, you know, are devoid of nutritional value, that they have nothing to offer to you in the way of nutrition? No, that's not it at all. It's again because God is trying to put a difference between his people and other people. Now, you know, Go, go, ha have somebody come up to you and ask, hey, you want to get some seafood? Say, I don't eat seafood. Whenever I hear that, I think you're a little weird. Yep. You know, because seafood's good. You know, depending on where you go. I don't recommend red lobster anymore, but, <laughs> you know, if you're, anytime I'm near an ocean, I was in Houston a few weeks ago, I'm like, where is the seafood at? Unfortunately, I didn't have time to get to it, but, you know, whenever you get somewhere where you can actually get fresh caught seafood, that's great. You know, now not everybody's not into seafood. I get it. You're just a little weird. That's fine. But that pr proves my point, you know, that, that not eating certain things makes, makes you peculiar, right? Like if, if, if this is what's on the menu, well, my, my religion tells me I cannot eat that. Right. You know, well, why is that? Why, you know, well, that's the way the Lord said, you know, in, in Deuteronomy, you know, and it just, it just sh makes a, a difference between God's people and his people. I mean, how else is God going to make a distinction between his people and the lost, his people and the heathen? I mean, it'd be, it'd be, how, how else besides be through their behaviors? Right. I mean, sure, you could reach down from heaven and maybe, you know, put a dot on our foreheads or something like that, right? <laughs> you know, but uh, wouldn't it be easier just to have us, you know, it would be more on our part. We would have to hold up our end of the bargain at that point. You know, and actually, and, you know, watch what we eat, or at least they did, you know, and watch what we allow, our, uh, what we're going to allow into our lives and what we're going to keep out. It's, it's, it, it puts something, uh, we have a responsibility to uphold to, to uh, take on that privilege of being God's peculiar people. You know, it's a two-way street. You know, we know whether, we, even if we don't do those things that God tells us, that we're still saved, we're still his people. It's just that, you know, we're not, we're not showing that to other people. Other people aren't going to notice that. So again, there's nothing inherently good or bad about any of these animals. Uh, <coughs> you know, uh, but... The purpose of them not eating it was simply to set them apart from others around them. And there is some symbology here, though, that uh, I've heard preached, and I think this is, this is true, it, and where it says, you know, they were allowed to eat animals that chewed uh, the cud and part the hoof, right? So I think everyone knows what chewing the cud is. The animal brings up that which is partially digested, chews it some more, and it goes down into another stomach. I think cows have, like, was it four stomachs? They bring food back up, then they chew it some more, it goes back into their stomach. It's just part of their digestive process. But they also part the hoof. You know, so they don't have a cloven hoof, but they, they part the hoof. He says, well, an animal that chews the cud and parts the hoof, you are allowed to eat. Now, <coughs> why is that? Why does God choose that animal? I believe it's symbolic of, basically, it boils down to this, this common phrase, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk, when you think about it. That's kind of what the symbology is there. This is somebody who not only walks the walk, but talks the talk. And I believe there's a lot, you know, there was a great, Pastor Anderson preached a great sermon on that called uh, Part the Hoof and Chew the Cut, I believe it, that's what it's called. Where he really goes into that. If you're interested, I really recommend that one. But 
that I believe that's some of the symbology that's behind it. That God doesn't want us just to be people that only talk the talk. He wants us to be people that you know say what we mean and also you know we preach and we practice what we preach. Because your your you know as the saying goes, your walk talks louder than your talk talks, right? <clears throat> so that's I believe what he's getting across here, and that's something that we see in, in the New Testament as well. He says in First John chapter three, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue but in deed and in truth. And, you know, if you recall, this was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. You know, they did a lot of talking, but they didn't do a lot of walking, did they? They did a lot of chewing of the cud, but they didn't part the hoof, right? And, and he said of them in, in Matthew chapter 23, then Je spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. He's saying, look, what they're telling you to do is right. It's, it's the law. It's, it's Bible. But do not after their works, before they say and do not. So they're saying, you guys need to do this. You need to do that. And they're saying, hey, what they're telling you to do is right, but don't be like them where you say to do this and then don't do it yourself. Don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> He's saying, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So I believe that's some of the symbology there in that dietary restriction. Why did God choose those specific animals? Is because of the symbology of walking the walk, talking the talk, not being hypocrite. And you know what? There's probably a whole lot more in there too. Even a, a passage like that that we would read and say, what in the, why? Why does that even in there? We don't, you know, this isn't for us today. Well, there's probably a lot that we could pull out of it if we would meditate upon the Word of God and compare Scripture with Scripture and, and, and we probably get even, even more out of it. But I will say this, you know, this needs to be clarified too, is that the dietary restrictions, these, these, this law, Deuteronomy here, only applied to, uh, the, to them, to the Israel during the time of the Levitical priesthood. You know, it, 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 all things were allowed prior to that. You know, if you recall in Genesis, God, uh, when Noah came off the ark, he told them, be fruitful and mu multiply, replenish the earth, and the fear and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. He said, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Yep. No restrictions. So you know, the surf and turf is back on the table. You know, the surf portion is there if you want it. Unless you're weird, right? So <laughs> I know there's somebody in this room that doesn't like I'm kind of picking on them a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, um, but it's there. You know, we can eat whatever we want. We can have whatever we want. We don't have to worry about, uh, well, at least that's the way it was back then. That's the point I'm trying to make. And all things are allowed today. And this is important to understand because there's some people, you know, Judaizers that would want to bring us back under the law, right. back under cardinal ordinances. And if you would, uh, turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. You know, people want to go back to this. They want to say, oh, let's bring the dietary restriction back into play. You know, they'll say, well, you shouldn't eat pork. That's, that's blasphemy, my friend. You know, fry up the bacon, get the pork sandwich out. Let's go to Smoky Moe's. You know, they're closed already, but, you know, I almost went there this afternoon. But uh, <laughs> ended up at Chipotle anyway. Chipotle, i got to start saying it right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. <laughs> it's old habits are hard to break. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, it says, The Holy Ghost, uh, this signifying that the way, uh, that the way into the holiness of all, uh, holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Well, as yet the first tabernacle was yet standing, <clears throat> which was a figure of the time then present in which were both offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reform reformation. So he's saying, look, the, this old, he's talking about the Levitical priesthood here, right? He's talking about uh, you know, the tabern the first tabernacle, the holiest of holies, which could not make the comers there unto perfect in regards to the conscience. And it says that it stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. And it says that all that would now the carnal ordinances that would in include, you know, carnal is the flesh, things that pertain to the body, like a diet, right? He's saying, look, your di the, the, the dietary restrictions would be included in the cardinal ordinances. He's saying these things were imposed on them until what? Until the time of reforma reformation. And it's not talking about Martin Luther. Okay? It's talking about, in verse 11, but Christ becoming an high priest of good things, 
uh, to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say of, uh, of this building. It's talking about the coming of Christ. That is the Reformation. Amen. Christ came. So all of these cardinal ordinances, the tabernacle. Do we still set up a tabernacle today? Nope. Do we still go sacrifice animals and, and have a priest that puts on the garments and burn incense and all of that that goes, on, that goes along with that? We don't do any of that. Uh, because those are cardinal ordinances that have been done away in Christ. And that would include uh, the dietary restrictions as well. Well, I mean, you can't, people, they want to select and pick out of the Old Testament what they want. Well, we're going to take the dietary restrictions, but we're going to leave off the animal sacrifice. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? You know, we're going we're gonna to take, you know, honoring, you know, keeping the Sabbath holy on the, on the fifth day, you know, but then we're, but we're not going to, you know, do some other part of the law. They, they pick and choose. That's not how it works. Either, you know, now there are certain things that have, you know, that are very, if they're not specifically spelled out uh, in the New Testament that are still in play. Right? Does God need to repeat everything in the Old Testament in order for us to understand that we, you know, we shouldn't kiss Grandma, <laughs> you know, or some, you know, in a bad way? You know, he it goes on. We're going to get into later in Deuteronomy where it talks about, you know, all of the different types of physical relationships that are, you know, wicked and not allowed. Does God need to reiterate all that in the New Testament for us to get it? No. no. All those things still apply unless they're specifically done away with in the New Testament. And one of the things that we see here in Hebrews, and if you would turn over to Colossians chapter 2, is the carnal ordinances were done away at the time of Reformation. And the time of Reformation was when Christ came. And it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised, the circumcision with, made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried him with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, doing what? Verse 14, blotting out, all, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There it is again. Carnal ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, it says, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them, hopefully triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat. And he's saying this right here. It's clear as day. Let no man judge you therefore in meat. You know, not just the eating of meat, whether it's okay or not to eat meat, but specifically what meats are, uh, uh, you know, forgive the pun, on the table and which ones aren't. Right. You know, that's what he's saying here. Don't judge. You know, if I want to sit down and eat sea rat and sea roach, you know, I have that liberty to yeah. do that. Amen. And the more I say that, the less likely I'm probably to do it because I'll have that image every time I go to eat it. <laughs> right? But if I want to eat something that, that doesn't, you know, chew the cud and something that doesn't part the hoof, I'm allowed, I, I, you can't judge me on that, according to Colossians, yep. according to the New Testament. You know, <laughs> he goes on, he says, you know, in meat or in drink or in spectrum and holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days. All these things have been specifically done away in Christ, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body of Christ. I mean, that was the purpose of those things, to point us to Christ. There's a lot of symbology in, in, this, in these things. So go ahead and go back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter... 14, we'll, we'll move on here. <coughs> and he says in verse 21, uh, <coughs> You shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, uh, that he may eat of it, or thou mayest say it, sell it unto an alien. Now, when it says an alien, it's talking about a stranger. It's not saying give it to E.T., <laughs> right? Because we all know he ate Reese's Pieces anyways. <laughs> this is so bad. But... You know, he's saying, look, if you're, something dies of itself, and this kind of thing goes on today. You know, I don't know that this would classify, roadkill would count as that. I mean, it's not really dying of itself. I think it's referring more of like a disease or something like that. He's saying, look, you're not going to eat of that. You're going to give it to somebody else. You know, you can give it to the stranger because he's not like you. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that, can you see how that would, back then especially, like that would make them a peculiar people to that person? Right. Hey, I found this fresh roadkill. That there's and people do this in Alaska and other places. Yeah. I knew a guy from Alaska. Uh, he lived up there. Worked for a while. He said that you would actually put in a per, you would you would apply for roadkill license, right. 
and you would get a tag, and they'd have your name on a list, and they'd just start calling down the list. And they, because I mean, you know, a moose or an elk or something like that hits up there, that's a, that's a lot of meat. I mean, you could feed a family for a very long time on one of those animals. And he said, you know, that someone would hit a moose or something like that, and uh, you know, he'd get the call, hey, over on highway so-and-so at the certain mile marker on the, you know, whatever bound lane, it's yours, go take it. And, you know, someone would go cut that up and eat it because there's a lot of good meat. So it's not like God's saying, hey, sell rancid meat to these people, right. you know, or give them something that's going to make them sick and die. That's not what he's saying here, right? <laughs> what he's saying is, like, you give them something that there's nothing wrong with it. You can sell it to them, but you're not allowed to eat it. Mm -hmm. Now, wouldn't that make me strange? You know, if, I, if, if, if a peculiar person, if I had perfectly good meat, and I just said, here, you can have it. Or here, I'll sell it to you. Well, why don't you want it? Is there anything wrong with it? No. Well, why don't you want it? You know, because back then, especially, it wasn't like you just went down to Bashes and, you know, picked up, you know, whatever the roast beef was on sale or whatever, you get a chuck roast or something. You know, meat was something you had to raise, and a lot of went into it. They'd say, we'd say, well, I don't do that because, you know, the, the Lord doesn't allow us to do that. Well, tell me more about this, this God of yours. You know, it would make us peculiar. You can see how these things would set you apart. And, that, you know, God does it in such a practical manner. He sets his people apart through their behavior, through the things that they do and the things that they're not allowed to do. <coughs> so he says there, uh, he, you know, he could sell it to an alien, for thou art an holy people in the Lord thy God. There again, that's the reason. Because you're holy, because you're different, because you're peculiar. And he says, thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Now, if anybody in this room has an idea of why that's there, I'd love to hear it. Because I've thought about that and talked to you guys about it. And I, I've not heard a really great explanation. I'm sure there is one. I know there is one. But that's, that's a real interesting verse. I, and I'm sure there's a lot to it. But uh, I don't have anything for it. So <laughs> if you got anything, let me know after the service. I'll say, where were you earlier? You know? But uh, verse 22, it says, uh, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place where uh, he shall chose, choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn of thy wine and thine oil, and the first thing of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So, you know, this is another, he goes, he's talking about the tithe back then, how it was done. But notice another great principle, even one that we practice here when it comes to the tithe, is that he says there, and, um, you know, he says, thou shalt truly try, tithe, Right, verse 22, then verse 23, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. So it wasn't like they take their tithe and give it to the priest, and then they're like, oh, you know, uh, well, oh, good thing we brought our sack lunch while the priest goes and eats our food, right? He says, no, you'd go there and you'd make the sacrifice, and the priest and you would eat together. You would eat with him. You know, you would partake of that tithe. You know, and that's a principle that we practice here. You know, that's why, you know, the baby shower was free of charge. You know, that's why all the borrows came down and, you know, that was part of the tithe. You know, that's why we're going to have the, uh, you know, the barbecues and the church picnics and the activities. That's that same principle. You know, it's not just that God's, uh, the people that are, you know, in, in full-time the ministry are just hoarding all this money and sitting on it and becoming filthy rich. Now, is that out there? Sure it is. Right? But, uh, you know, the principle is that, you know, everybody gets to partake in that to some degree. And he says here, uh, and I don't want to go on about the tithe because I preached a sermon about that recently. And he says in verse 24, so he's telling them, you know, hey, you got to bring the first fruits of your, 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 your seed, you know, all your fruits and vegetables, your livestock. You got to bring this to the place where he puts his name and tithe it. And he says in verse 24, if the way be too long for thee, so thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, uh, when the Lord hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money and bind up the money in thine hand, and shall go into place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And shall bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. For oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. So he's saying, look, God, you know, God is very practical. You know, God, God understands man's position. And God, that's what I love about the Bible, it's so practical in all of these things. He says, look, he understood that there's going to be people that are very far away from Jerusalem or Shiloh or wherever he put up the tabernacle or the temple eventually. And he says, look, you can, if, if it's too far for you, if you have so much abundance that you, know, you, you, you don't even have a cart big enough to haul it all down there, it's just going to be too much work, it's not practical, then just turn into money and go down there and buy it. I mean, God, he's, just, he's very practical in the way he, uh, he asks us to serve him. And <clears throat> now it, I do want to point out here where it says in verse 26, that they were allowed to buy 
wine or for strong drink, right? And some people I've seen turn to say, well, say, well, see that there? That is an endorsement for drinking alcohol. They'll say, hey, the Bible says you could have gone down there and bought strong drink. Now, I do not believe that this is an endorsement of drinking alcohol at all. Uh, in, in, in the same verse, if you notice, it, it says there, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. Notice the drinking is left out, right? In other passages, God says, talks about eating and drinking, okay? And I don't believe that's a coincidence. And if you look elsewhere, and we're not going to dive real deep into this, but, you know, God talks about strong, or strong wine being poured out as a drink offering in the holy place before the Lord. I believe that's what was to be take, taken place with this. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, it doesn't say anywhere. In, it says they're allowed to eat, but it doesn't say they're allowed to drink this stuff, right? It doesn't say go ahead and drink the strong drink. And, you know, elsewhere, we know, if we know our Bibles, is that strong drink is strictly forbidden in the Bible. And he says in Leviticus chapter, so this would be a contradiction for God to say, don't drink alcohol, except when you come to worship me. Except when you're going to come worship me, then you can just get drunk as a skunk. All bets are off. You know, get three sheets to the wind and make a fool of yourself at the tabernacle or at the temple. Right. That makes no sense. Okay, right. and, and anybody who knows anything about strong drink is, is it doesn't take much. That's why it's called strong drink, right? Now, I don't believe that this is referring exactly to what, you know, this isn't your black label whiskey, but this is, you know, potent, you know, fermented beverages that would get people drunk is what I believe it's referring to. <laughs> he says, uh, we know elsewhere that it's forbidden, you know, for specifically in the priests, you know, in Leviticus chapter 10, he said, and he spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, nor thy sons with thee. He says, Look, you're not to drink strong drink. We know Proverbs, right? Proverbs has a lot to say about this subject. It says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And, you know, any of us that have either had, an exp had experience with this in the past or know people who, who are involved in it can probably tell, tell a lot of very embarrassing stories about you know, people that who are who have been deceived by strong drink, yep. and even tragic things have taken place right. due to strong drink. You know, a, a things that people are not proud of. Uh, <coughs> it's raging. You know, it says there, Proverbs chapter thirty-one. It says, "It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink." And what about Proverbs twenty-three? And I've preached on this. I know uh, Brother Cale was down here. He he preached on this recently. So we're not going to turn to all these passages. But he says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, or giveth its color in the cup with when it, it move itself aright. Saying, look, it's not for the priests, it's not for the kings. He's saying, if you're deceived by it, you're not wise. And he says here, you're not to look upon the wine when it is red. Now, what's the problem with the wine? Because is, you think God doesn't want you looking at it because of the color? Is that what God is saying, don't look at it? It's the wrong color? You know, it's, it's too much of a chartreuse, you know, when it gets more into a burgundy. You know, or whatever. That's not what God's. That's not the problem with the wine. Right. The problem with the wine is that it moveth itself right. It's fermented, right? It's, it's it has living organisms in there that will get you drunk. It has yeast in it. And you know, some people will object to all this and say, "Well, you know, everything you just cited only applies to the priests. It only applies to Lemuel, kings, right? It only it only applies to the priests, the sons of Aaron." Well, what does the Bible say about us? It says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace and from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which were before his throne, <coughs> and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And it says that in verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto our God. Amen. So not, you know, it's, it's twofold not for us. You know, not every priest was a king, right? And not every king was a priest. We're both. We are kings and priests unto our God. And it's not for kings and it's not for priests. And notice, if, you know, I know I didn't have you turn there, but if you, if you paid attention there when I read verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests. That's present tense. You know, if you're saved today, you already are a king. You already are a priest. You, already, you, know, that you might as already well be in the kingdom, ruling and reigning with Christ. You're as good as there. So it's not for us to be partaking in strong drink and things like that. And to turn to a passage like that and try to I mean, if that's the, you're, you're pretty desperate to go to a passage like that to try to justify the, the, the consumption of alcohol when there's so many other verses that strictly forbid it and condemn it and cast it in a very poor light. And, uh, and like I said earlier, anybody who knows, has been around it, involved with it, knows everything that goes wrong with it. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out. And, you know, the, so the warning, you know, is don't find out for yourself, you know, kids. 
There's no reason for you to go figure that out. The Bible already told you. Alcohol, it will ruin your life. God already told you, you know, don't cut yourself. Don't go and do those things. Right? So we've already, we can learn so many things about what not to do from the Bible. And it will help us become what? A holy and peculiar people unto God. When we learn to abstain from the things we should abstain from and start to actually do the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, <coughs> now, we'll finish up here in verse 27. He says, And the Levite that is with thine gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thy increase the same year, and it shall lay it up with thine gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part or inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are in thy gate shall come, and shall eat and be satisfied. You know, God doesn't have a welfare system. You know, but that's not because God doesn't care for the poor. It's because God uh, has provided a better way to take care of, of folks that are in, uh, you know, in, in, in tough circumstances, such as the fatherless, the widow. You know, you think of the fatherless, you know, that, that's probably in all likelihood going to be a, a poor family. There's one, you know, the maybe mom has to go out and earn the income now. You know, she didn't, you know, if she's widowed later in life, she didn't get a chance to develop the skills as a, you know, as a tradesman that dad did to go out and earn a, a, a profitable living. Right. You know, and now she's got all these kids to provide for. You know, that, that makes for a very poor set of circumstances um, where, you know, food can become uh, scarce. You know, nutritionally, it's not there. So God has provided a way to take care of the fatherless and, and the widow, right? And like I was just saying, you know, he says, you know, the, 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 the woman that has lost her husband, you know, maybe doesn't even have kids to, to provide for her, you know, or has, a, you know, a whole bunch of little kids that she herself has to take care of. God's provided a way to take care of them. This isn't the only way either. Uh, you know, it, we'll get into it later in Deuteronomy where God tells them to not go back after the sheev if they forget it in the field, but to leave it for the poor, that they were not to, you know, glean every corner of the field, that they were to leave some behind for, so that the poor of the land could come and eat. <coughs> and he says there, and notice it says, that the, these poor people were to come and shall eat. G God didn't say send it to them in their post office box right. and let them just you know walk out in their you know pajamas and just go you know or get it electronically and just decide to, you know when they when they work up enough ambition to go use their EBT card or something like that. They had to go there. You know, they had to put some effort into it. You know, when the God told them to leave the stuff in the field, they had to actually put some effort. You know, and say, well, why is that? Because they probably felt better about themselves. Rather, you know, you feel better about yourself when you actually have to put it, some effort into it. Especially, you know, as a poor person, maybe, maybe, you know, uh, maybe they don't have the ability to, uh, you know, do a, a lot of things, you know, uh, to work a regular job or whatever it is. They have an opportunity to go out and, and to earn what they get. And that gives you a sense of self-worth, is what I'm trying to say. So the God system's better, you know, and it's not that God, you know, you know, neglects the poor. You know, God, in fact, you know, warns his people to to not neglect the poor, to not treat them poorly, but to treat them well, to care for them, to have compassion. Now, we'll, it'll come up later in, in, in coming weeks what actually constitutes the poor, but we have a, a, a different idea of what it means today, which is not biblical, I believe. But God does provide for the poor, and this is one means that He does it. That when people would come and eat. Of the, uh, they bring their tithes. It wasn't just, you know, it, if we were to go to Jerusalem, if we were under, live back then and took all our tithe, our, our first fruits of our animals and our, you know, our, our field and went there, you know, it wouldn't just be the Le Levite over there, you know, stuffing himself to the gills, you know, and leaving us with nothing. You know, we'd get to partake in that as well. And it wouldn't be just us, you know, it would be the widow would come along with us. You know, and, and it would and it, it'd be a great time of fellowship. And if you recall, we read there earlier, it says, and you shall go and you shall eat and you shall do what? You shall rejoice. It would, you know, it'd been a great, um, fest, you know, festival. It'd been a, a great time of fellowship and food and, and, and a really great system, praising the Lord, worshiping God. This wasn't, a, this wasn't dreary. This wasn't something that they did grudgingly. In fact, I'll be perfectly honest, you know, there's a, there's a little uh, a Mexican meat shop right down the road from where uh, I live, and I go by it every day um, to the church, and several times during the week, they have just a big grill that they go out and they just grill up all their meat. You know, they turn the stereo speakers on, and it's, they're having a good time over there. And <laughs> I mean, the flames are like leaping out onto 40th Street, and the smell of just burning, f you know, cow flesh just comes across, <laughs> and it just smells so good, right? And sometimes I go, maybe that Levitical priesthood wasn't such a bad thing, you know? Maybe Maybe, maybe these Judaizers are onto something. Maybe we, no, I'm just kidding, you know. 
But, uh, you know, this thing, I mean, imagine just having been there and smelling that and all the food cooking and the vegetables and everything. Man, the Bible makes you hungry sometimes, right? <laughs> but uh, what's this chapter about? This chapter is about, you know, God's people being peculiar. Yeah. God's people being holy, being set apart unto him. And how are they to do it? You know, not through just their words, but actually how they behave. Not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. You know, through... Uh, abstaining from some things and practicing other things in their practical life. That's how we're going to be peculiar today. We're going to obey the commandments of God when he tells us what, what to do and what not to do. That's how we're going to be holy. That's how we're going to be set apart. Let's go ahead and close the word of prayer.